Hi, I'm Hani Gluck, and you are listening to Growing Global. I am passionate about helping entrepreneurs grow and scale their business. I've been an entrepreneur for over two decades. I built my own businesses, sold a business, and continue to leverage the global economy. Growing Global is about educating, inspiring, and motivating entrepreneurs or aspiring entrepreneurs on how to take yourself and your business to the next level. I am so excited to have with me today, Dr. Heidi Jenenga, PT, DPT, ATC. Uh, She is the co-founder, chief clinical officer of WebPT, a seven-time Inc. 5000 honoree and the leading software solution for physical, occupational, and speech therapists. Heidi advises on the company's strategic direction, product innovation, while advocating for the rehab therapy profession on an international scale. Since starting the company in 2008, Heidi has guided WebPT through several milestones, including a seed round with Canal Partners, a VC round with Battery Ventures, and most recently a partnership with PE firm Warburg Pingus. Five acquisitions, numerous awards, including Best in Class, Best Place to Work, and Inc.'s top company culture. In 2017, Heidi was honored by Health Data Management as one of the most powerful women in IT. That's impressive. And she was a finalist for Ernst & Young Entrepreneur of the Year. In 2018, she was named the Ed Denenson Business Leader of the Year at the Arizona Technology Council's Governor's Celebration of Innovation. She's also an active member of the YPO Scottsdale chapter, and her proudest accomplishment is being a mom to her sweet daughter, Ava. She also enjoys traveling, hiking, taiko drumming, and practicing yoga in her spare time. Hi, thank you so much for being here with me. Um, I know you and I have had numerous conversations about many things and healthcare, women, motherhood. Um, So I'm so glad that you uh, have the time to chat with me today. Well, thanks for asking, Jenny. Thank you so much for this opportunity to be able to speak with more people in general, right? Because we've had this conversation too, that uh, we always obviously want to empower and inspire more women, but it takes a village and it takes a community of everyone. Um, We're 50% of the population, so the other 50% has to be on board with this uh, need for more leadership, diverse leadership. Um, And uh, so anyway, I'm thrilled to be here and excited about this conversation. Awesome. So I know you are all about culture, like even in our first conversation, I know you work so hard. And even in, you know, I first heard you speak at an EO event. And I was really impressed with how much effort you put into your culture. Tell us, tell us a little bit for those that don't know anything about WebPT and their culture. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, WebPT is an electronic health record software company um, specifically designed for rehab therapists. So physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists. I am a physical therapist. So um, it was born out of a need that I had in my practice uh, in as a clinic director. Um, one of our largest expenses was transcription and dictation. Uh, And so I was trying to solve that with technology. And this was back in 2006. And so, you know, a lot of physicians had started transitioning and using some sort of EHR or digital platform for their documentation. And I thought, well, there has to be something out there for PTs as well. Uh, When we did our research, we found that there really uh, wasn't anything web-based. It was all server-based and very expensive, even for uh, my practice, which uh, was three clinics and one of the largest sports medicine uh, practices in the country. And so uh, we decided to build something. So I put my head together with a software engineer, and we built something that was uh, originally just supposed to be for my practice. And kind of like many quintessential entrepreneur stories, we did a little market research, and we found that 80% of the industry in rehab therapy were having the same problems I was in terms of documenting on pen and paper and spending a ton of money on transcription and dictation. And so in February of 2008, we decided to launch the company um, and we sold five clinics that first month. 
And you mentioned some of the progress that we've had over the last 12 years, but now we're a $100 million company. We have uh, 550 employees across all 50 states. We are still primarily, or are primarily, we're all based here in the um, uh, United States. So we haven't ventured out internationally yet, but that's definitely on the roadmap. And you have 40%, a little over 40% market share, which equates to about 85,000 users and over 15,000 practices using our software. So it's been an amazing ride, but the foundation of all of that, we feel like the part of our foundation of success has been the culture that we started, you know, way back in 2008. Um, And with any company, you know, the culture begins with the founders, of course. Um, And as we sort of started to bring people together to, in those early stages, um, it was all about sort of defining it, not truly defining it, but understanding the culture was going to, we didn't want, both of us had, as founders, sorry, had, had grown up in more of the corporate environment. And so we constantly made decisions that we didn't want a lot of that corporatized sort of decision making and hierarchy and, and things that we didn't feel were productive in the early stages. And so Um, As we hired people, we hired people that had very entrepreneurial mindset who were willing to put lots of hats on, um, had some expertise in area, but were very curious and could, you know, pitch in wherever they were needed. It wasn't until actually 2010 that we truly defined our culture. It had grown, we'd grown to about 40 employees at that point. Um, And we'd taken that first round of funding in. and, And one of the things that we did with that money initially was to hire more people. Uh, and so within six months of getting that funding, we had hired more people in the company that had been in the company for the previous two years. And so we felt a culture shift. We didn't like it. And so we, we said, hey, we need to define what does it mean to be a part of this company? And that's when our core values were born. Um, and we didn't do it as leaders. We actually sat down with the entire team at that point, And we had like a company stand up. We asked the questions, you know, who do we, what do we stand for? Why are we here? You know, what types of of, of people are we attracting and want to be in this type of work? What mindset do we want to have? And we filled up a giant whiteboard and all of those words then got distilled down into what now are our eight core values. And that's one of the things I'm actually most proud of um, in the company because those core values were laid at such a foundational moment and they have completely lasted and are still so woven into everything that we do as an organization, the way that we hire in terms of leaders, um, you know, all the way up to the CEO. Um, We're looking for a new CFO right now. And I mean, we are truly like leading forward with uh, those core values as, as a cultural fit because it's so important to the organization. So what are your core values? Those eight (laughs) core values. (laughs) Yeah. So, um, we lead with raving fans, uh, so creating raving fans because it, it, at the end of the day, we are a software as a service company, uh, and so we have to uh, make sure that we always think about you know what's best for our customers or what as we call them our members, and of course you know raving fans and we and customers obviously are not just our external customers. We are internally as employees, customers to each other. Every department is a customer to to the other one and every employee is a customer to each other. So that that mirrors itself. Everything we do externally mirrors itself internally. Um, We have True Grit, which is, um, you know, just really about finding, uh, being problem solvers, innovators, finding, getting what we need to get done uh, to create those raving fans. Um, we have a health and wellness um, uh, a core value, um, which specifically uh, talks about, you know, us being a healthcare company. We want to make sure that we are good role models for that and, and have a lot of wellness services uh, provided, um, but also as advocates for the industry, as you mentioned earlier. So we have another core value um, around just our work ethic and being rock solid. Um, right now, we've been using that language a lot with obviously the the changes that have had to been made and the pivots and uh, things that have been going on within the organization of, of really pulling together as a group um, and figuring out how to get stuff done. Um, everyone's favorite is FF own up. Um, 
which is all around accountability. We don't really, we say accountability, but when we talk about this core value, it's really around F up, own up. And that one in the beginning really was around making sure that we, people understand that it's okay to make mistakes um, and that we want innovative thinking and we want to try things no matter if, um, you know, they may fail, but that's okay. We're going to learn a lot from that. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that people weren't just in a rush and, you know, sweeping things under the rug and not paying attention to it. Um, that we wanted to make sure that people really understood it's okay, keep going, screw up, but don't let anybody else behind you make that same mistake again, right? And so um, that's, you know, kind of one of those ones that ends up being everybody's favorite because who has the word, who drops the F-bound in their core values? Well, what PT does. Um, <laughs> awesome. Um, and well, then that one sounds a little. That one does sound a little bit like Facebook, where it's uh, what they. What does he say? Like break it. Like as Zuckerberg said something about break it. Um, he wants you to break stuff, right? Yeah. Because that was part of his early, you know, in early stages, and then he kind of changed it to uh, you know break stuff in not so destructive way. But it's the same idea of um, you know. I think Intel has. They want good news to travel, bad news to travel faster than good news, right? So those are all like, it's okay, just communicate and tell us what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's part of the sort of team atmosphere and, and obviously being accountable for your work and being proud of what you, what you accomplish. Um, and, you know, from early, early on, that is so important as you're moving so fast and growing uh, through these growth stages, right? Um, so another value is uh, kind of paying homage to our um, Arizona roots, um, and it's uh, do mas with menos, so more with less, right? So it's all about resource efficiency, uh, and I think that's been um, one of our things that we really get a lot of credit for as we have gone through these phases of um, uh, different financial stages of our, of our growth. Uh, because, you know, too often you, you raise um, 10 million when you only have made one, right? And uh, people are, 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 are willing to pay a bet, but you have a lot of debt in the organization. We've been really mindful of making sure that no vaporware or anything is being sold. Like it's truly value add. Um, and that's shown up in our, our bottom line and our, our P&Ls too. So um, that's been really important. And then the last one, um, which I think is yeah, part of our ethos, is all about community outreach and giving back. Um, we have started a WebPT Foundation, um, which, um, you know, is dedicated to helping uh, some different uh, nonprofits within the uh, different areas that we have uh, our locations in, as well as giving back to the, uh, to the industries in which we serve you know, with the American Physical Therapy Association, Speech Language Pathology, ASHA, um, and, the, and the AOTA, the American uh, Occupational Therapy Association. So um, it's been wonderful to, to see how each one of those values has grown throughout the uh, growth of, of our company as well. And not just words on a wall, I guess. That's beautiful. I love that. That's really nice. I mean, we're doing something similar in India where we're helping orphanages. And I just think it's so nice to have a company that is not just in it for the sake of the profit, but they take a piece of their profits and are doing something good for the greater community. So that's really beautiful. It's all about being a conscious company. Um, we subscribe to sort of the philosophy around conscious capitalism, which um, really has promotes sort of four pillars and one of those is really community and it's all about using or having companies that um, can use profit for as a power of good right and so there's so much opportunity to be able to do that with um, building such a great brand right that people want to believe in and they want to get behind even if they don't use your product right away like you are relevant to them and you they see how how you um, are interacting and, and are part truly a part of the industry versus just another brand just another widget right that wants to uh, sell sell me something I guess okay this is wow this is amazing 
let's talk about today because I know part of what you built back in 2010 when you first started with the culture is now it's kind of this is the reason why, right? Because now everyone's home and we're not together. So tell me, how, how has this been for you and your team, the transition, work from home? Yeah, I couldn't be prouder of the organization and how we have come together, um, starting even at our CEO, who, you know, our mantra right now is all about hugging our cash and doing everything we need to do to keep uh, the organization in a very positive state in terms of being able to serve our customers to the highest level, um, but also to serve our people, right? Um, we feel like it's a family and we've done everything we, we could and can um, to make sure that everyone was going to be able to work from home immediately um, so that we could preserve uh, positions and jobs um, and to date, we have not had to do any layoffs or any furloughs. Um, everybody is staying busy. Um, and we pivoted quickly to be able to get uh, Zoom and telehealth up and running within our platform. It was on our roadmap, but we accelerated it um, to bring it forward um, to an immediate need uh, to serve our, our customers, serve our members. And so uh, I couldn't be prouder of, uh, and you know, you have, we do, we've been doing weekly communication with our, all the teams, um, Nancy, our CEO, and I do a webinar every other week. And then um, we have a CEO letter that goes out every week uh, to just update everyone on how, you know, the things that we talked about the week before, how are we doing measuring up against those? Are we staying on track with the cash reserves that we said we were, we were going to have? And how is the company doing? We give an industry update. How is the industry as a whole? Because we have a lot of data that we're circulating. Um, we have an amazing, amazing marketing team that, and content development team that has just pulled together because there's been a lot of changes, obviously, in regulatory, regulatory environment right now of what, what's essential, what's not essential, changes in Medicare uh, regulations on who's able to do telehealth, what are the code changes that have been implemented. I'm sure that you guys are doing the same thing of having to implement new codes quickly into your platform that people are now using so they can get paid for those services. So staying on top of all of that, and I mean, it's just been amazing. And you just, you don't do that unless people feel 100% engaged, not only with your organization, but they feel like they're working for something that's more meaningful themselves. And they truly are serving our customers. And gosh, what a wonderful feeling to just know that as an entrepreneur, that foundation started with your, your passion for an industry and now has, you know, been able to be sewn into all of these amazing employees who feel that passion with you. And that, to me, is what has been our greatest success and, it, and enabled us to get through these tough times together. That's amazing. How are physical therapists doing telehealth right now? So um, Medicare has, um, has provided us the opportunity to do e-visits, which um, are, are check-ins um, that you can do. It doesn't have to necessarily be over telehealth. Right now, we're doing a ton of advocacy because we have telehealth codes, that uh, CPT codes that um, are provided that we can use. However, we have not been deemed providers that can actually perform telehealth, at least from a Medicare standpoint. So we're hoping that in this next final rule, there should be some things coming out that, that it, they've said that it's kind of an oversight because we have the codes, but yet just as providers, we aren't able to utilize them. <laughs> so silly, but we have other means that we can do. And then of course, all the, a lot of commercial insurances, all the top commercial insurances have now come out and said, yes, we will honor those codes and uh, physical therapists, occupational therapists can, can utilize them. Um, state practice acts have had to change as, in temporary moves to allow therapists because some of the state practice acts weren't um, uh, empowering therapists to use telehealth. So a lot of changes have had to been made in this very short interim period. Some of them are temporary, but we're hoping as you know, time goes by and we see you know, what the quote unquote new normal is, that some of those will become more permanent. And that's been part of our role as well is in our advocacy arm of really um, working with, you know, others to, you know, lobby Congress, lobby our, our Congress folks. We've sent out templates to our greater industry to make it easy for them to just 
send a letter to your congressperson. Um, we've worked with the American Physical Therapy Association to do something. They've, they've done something similar and made it super easy for you to do. So just trying to get that grassroots effort of um, uh, advocacy to get more uh, ability for a therapist to do it. But, you know, you're able to do similar, like we're having this conversation. I would have a similar conversation with my patient. I would potentially have them go through a few exercises, get, you know, get them progressed on their exercises, perhaps look at range of motion and what they're able to do. So there's definitely a lot of assessment capabilities that you can do. Um, it's, not a hundred percent. Um, there's many things I can't do cause we're a very hands-on profession. Um, but you know, getting through this interim period for people that may have just started post-surgery, um, uh, rehab or that are, you know, having aches and pains right now because they are more sedentary and they're having to sit <laughs> and do meetings in different chairs than maybe they were used to at their job, their office. Um, there's lots of things that we can be helping with right now. Uh, even ergonomic setup of your workstation at home, things like that. That's wonderful. As you know, we're both moms and dealing with our children home from school. I, my husband, I don't feel is that affected as I am affected because I think as moms, the default responsibility of children in general is just like a female role. And I know that all of your employees, all of my employees that are moms are dealing with the same reality. How are yep. you fostering empathy and flexibility for those employees? Well, first and foremost, I'd say we are celebrating anytime there is a young little creature that comes into a Zoom meeting or, um, you know, even a, a furry one comes into a Zoom meeting. We love that and we are honoring that. Um, uh, we are being very flexible in terms of meeting time. So people, you know, if they need to have different times. We're being flexible with changing uh, schedules, things like that. Um, with the work from home, it's, it's not necessarily a nine to five job anymore, right? If you need to get up early and you get your work done from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then have to log on again, it's all about productivity and, um, project-based, if you, you get your stuff done by a deadline, I don't care when you do it, right? If you want to work through the middle of the night, that's on you, but we've got a deadline to meet and you figure out how to get there. Um, we are doing a lot of in fun engagement things. So from a cultural event perspective, um, you know, we, we've had, we've hosted um, a cooking class online. So interactive, like family things. So we partnered up with uh, the Larry is a restaurant uh, downtown and one of their chefs uh, basically did a zoom meeting and we could all log in and it was fun to kind of see him prepare. And he was like, okay, here's all the ingredients you need to have prepared before you come. Um, and so we've done that. Um, I'm actually hosting a bring your kid to work day. So we're going to do a, a 30 minute zoom session in which uh, my daughter and I have a nine-year-old daughter who's in third grade. Um, so uh, she and I are hosting this event for the entire company. Anybody can join in. Um, and we're going to talk about how we've been dealing with the balance of being a homeschool teacher. I've got to have that hat on at the same time as, you know, continuing to lead with WebPT and, you know, being on boards of nonprofits that are having meetings. So how are we doing all of that together? Like, because I'm a single mom at this point and how do, how do I balance all of those things? And at the same time, like getting your house clean and getting the dishes done and, you know, all, <laughs> all the things like you said that's, that come, seem to come down on our shoulders. So we, we're doing that. Um, and, you know, it's, it's discipline, it's scheduling, it's lots of conversations, it's walks around the block to in, in the interim, it's being flexible if, if things don't get done the way that you had it planned. So uh, it's definitely, uh, I've had to release a little bit of my control of wanting things very structured. I am not, I mean, I'm, I try to keep it structured, but if things don't quite go quite as planned, it's okay for that day. Again, a, again, a longer term view for the week of what do we need to get done for the week and making sure all of that happens versus day by day. So... Those are just things from, from my perspective that I've, I'm trying to, that we're doing with as a company and then what I'm dealing with at home. That's, uh, it sounds a lot like my, my world right now is, you know, <laughs> just the juggling. And I like your perspective about looking at it on a weekly view. So you're, you mentioned the control thing. 
do you have something in place to, because I've been asked so much uh, over the last month, because I manage a remote team, this is my normal. I've always worked remotely um, and I manage a pretty large team offshore. So how do you, have you added any new products or have you, did you have something in place um, so that you could manage and you could see if someone's spending you know, five hours on YouTube versus, you know, getting there. Walk me through that. So we had a lot of things in place for, especially for, from an hourly employee perspective, but also from a productivity metric perspective. So for example, in our services teams on number of calls, time on calls, we already had all that in place. Um, And so although they couldn't necessarily alter their hours, we've been, we've been flexible with, with the scheduling of people. So if there's just folks who, you know, are not going to have a quiet room between X time and X time, like perhaps they take the early morning shift or something like that. So we've been very flexible in trying to do that, but we've already, we already had a lot of metrics and and online uh, KPIs that we could look at from a productivity standpoint. So, and then from our services on our billing team, same thing, like we can see how many client claim transactions that, that people are processing and all of that. So we knew what the normal baseline was. So if for whatever reason you're starting to, to see your numbers decline, well, we're going to ha- we're going to talk about it and, and figure out why and is there a solution to how we can make you more productive or, or support you in what you need. The response has been amazing, I'll just say, uh, with people working from home. I mean, I'll, we were kind of a, a HQ centric, uh, more brick and mortar uh, centric company, and uh, so far, from what we've seen and how fast we've been able to implement the work from home policies, um, you know, we're definitely changing as an organization moving forward. Not that we're going to swing the pendulum all the way, but for sure, as we think about return to work, um, the whole vibe of the organization is going to change a little bit. You know, people have been asking us to do more work from home over the years, and we've kind of dug our heels in a little bit because we love the sort of collaboration, the water cooler conversations, the, the changes that can happen quickly because you have everyone in one room. But with the Zoom capabilities now, I mean, it's not much different, right? And people are very much, we're very much adapting to it. The other, uh, so a couple of things that we have implemented, we've implemented Zoom now across the company. So everyone can do, I mean, we had Google Hangouts and things, but it's definitely not as user-friendly, I guess. But also we love seeing, you know, you got seven people in a room, you want to see everybody. And so we, we love that capability with Zoom. So we implemented Zoom across the board. Um, we were just starting, we, we had been using Slack for about a year, but not everybody was on it. And so Slack has now become a very fun and great place for communication. We have a few channels that, I mean, one of them is just called the hashtag random channel, where it's just an outlet for people to post funny memes or videos and share recipes and, you know, just interact with lots of people within the organization. So um, that's been a, a fun outlet from a culture perspective to just be able to, to jump into conversations with people that and check in with folks that you may not, like they might be in Virginia or, you know, easily check in with folks. So I would say those are probably the two main areas that we've ramped up in terms of this work from home. And then obviously policies to go along with that because we're so keen on making sure HIPAA compliance standards are being maintained through all of this. Have you seen anything in regard to some of your employees being depressed or in a funk? Um, I've seen some people in my organization go through stages of denial and grief and, you know, and obviously the situation in India is very different than it is here, but maybe you want to speak to that if, and and how you've deal, how you're dealing with it, if you have seen it. For sure. Yeah. We, um, we definitely had a few, Folks that have, uh, we've, you know, continued to try to reach out to everyone and do check-ins. Um, and there's been a, the, the few folks that have probably um, had a few moments or, or moments, days, week, a week maybe of, of kind of decline is, uh, have been mainly the folks that are single um, and feel very isolated. So they don't have family. Maybe they have a dog or a cat, but they're, they feel like they, they, they just can't interact. And we use the DISC profile. Um, so we personalities of different types of people. And so the eyes, the people that are very social and love the interaction, feel very isolated and 
depressed, if you will, um, because they can't, they've not, they're craving it and they can't find it and they can't get it. And this, this interaction is not the same. <laughs> so, um, you know, encouraging the, the happy hours, um, the, you know, the social interaction, not just work interaction between people and groups, um, even, you know, being led by some of our senior leaders um, has also been really well received. Um, again, similar, like little groups, like we, I, I mentioned with your bring your kid to work, we've had other, you know, functions like that where people can interact and, um, you know, talk about how things are going and just have an outlet to share, right. And say, Hey, I'm, I've been feeling pretty sh- crappy. Uh, yeah, and it pe- other people, you know, chiming in and saying, yeah, well, me too, but the, here's how I got out of it, or here's something that I did. And that Slack channel has been really helpful for that as well. Yeah, I think just the conversations, um, understanding that we're all going through similar emotions and similar, yeah. and how we deal with it, we really do get strength from each other. So I think, I think creating, creating the means of communication and, and yeah. allowing people to, I think is a great idea. And also well, just sharing. Yeah. Sorry. One thing I would just, I would say too, just from a leadership perspective, Nancy, our CEO um, is, is of a D mindset. So she is very um, uh, numbers oriented and driven. Right. And so having her share personal anecdotes of how, you know, things that she's doing to, to get more of that personal side they get that a lot from me, um, but for her and I are very yin yang really like that. And so having her be more vulnerable and share, like, listen, I, I this is I'm I'm dealing with like not this is not fun all the time. You know what I mean? Like we're getting stuff done, and it's all you've got to have that positive sort of um, outlook. But to share that, hey, listen, I've had moments where I didn't feel like getting up today, or you know what I mean? To, to show that you're a real human and that no matter what level you also feel that way has really, I think, helped in terms of not only her connecting with more people in the organization, but also helping them to see, wow, if Nancy's going through this, then it's okay. Like if I'm, I'm going through this too, like it's okay. Everybody's dealing with it. It's funny that you're saying this because now I know this is all Brene Brown stuff, which you actually <laughs> clued me into, and I'm such a big fan of her. But it was based on our conversations like a while back. So yeah. I'm all about you know for leaders to lead with vulnerability. It's definitely very effective. Okay, so I want to touch on the because I've been very curious about this, and I've spoken to some EO people, and we've had different. Um, conversations about keeping your company private versus going the VC route and the, like the pros and cons of, of each. Would you, are you, are you happy with your decision to, to have taken this company, you know, gotten outside investors, outside capital? Are you, I'm sure you're satisfied with that, right? Yes, I am extremely satisfied, but we've also met every goal and, and blown every number that we said we were going to do. We've met every sort of metric and, and, and made a lot of right decisions. Um, so we've been very, I, I mean, luck's been on our side <clears throat> in lots of different ways. Obviously, there's been a lot of great decisions by smart people and, and us as founders along the way that have helped pave the path to for the success. Um, but it's kind of like making the big leagues. Um, And there are very few companies that can um, go down this path and have the same success that we've had. And so it is a very personal choice. Um, And knowing the pros and cons of what you're getting into um, is really important to where you can't mask or, or say, oh, well, if Heidi did it, that means that I can do it too. You know what I mean? And I would love to be that inspiration. And I think, you know, we, we've had a lot of um, people that, are, that uh, not a lot, but we've had people that left our company to go start other companies and are using what they call the WebPT playbook in terms of how we were able to succeed in the, in the fashion that we were. So I know that there's definitely things that, you know, if you, you have a track that you can follow, uh, it helps a lot. Um, but, you know, I'm also an advocate of small business. I, this is what runs this country. Um, right now, we're, we're, we're hurting right now because of it. But at the end of the day, you're an entrepreneur, whether you have a family business that 
um, you know, does well for your family and, and provides a service or a piece of software that helps others, but you, you know, you're a million dollar company versus the, the hundred million dollar company. Like we're all, we're all entrepreneurs. And so it's a very personal um, decision-making process of, you know, what, what do you want for your life? Because it is, it is a much stress, more stressful, um, much different uh, uh, leadership requirements um, in terms of leading a, a large group of people. And you know this. I mean, you've grown to significant numbers that you're leading every day. It is hard. Uh, it's a grind. Um, and unless you really have the passion, but also the willingness to surround yourself and hire people that are smarter than you and be humble enough to say, I don't have all the answers and I need people to help me along the way, um, be willing to make mistakes, big ones, um, and not give up when those things happen, uh, to also be brave enough and disciplined enough to make decisions and stay niche or narrow in an area that is your core competency. And then, and then if you're, you know, when you're ready to spread farther, you've got to find people that that's their core competency. To, so, you know, you, you've got more expertise in different areas. Um, and I'll just say for us, it's always been at the end of the day about hiring and partnering for culture that people that match you, the values that you prioritize and that you believe in, once you stray from that, the company it will never be the same and you will never feel the same within the organization. And so um, we've, we've stayed the, down that track. That's our secret sauce. Um, and it, that has enabled me as a founder to stay this long in the business and to feel great about it. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's not a lot of entrepreneurs that stay from zero to a hundred million or to, to through a private equity round. Usually you drop off. Um, I don't know. I'm a, I'm an avid learner. I, I find every stage of this company has been amazing and I've learned so much more and continue to feel like I add value to the organization, which at the end of the day is what we all want. Right. And so, um, back specifically to your question, I am super thrilled from a personal level of what I've been able to accomplish as a uh, entrepreneur, as a physical therapist, giving back and leaving this amazing legacy to, to my, my industry, but also from a financial perspective of, you know, beyond any of my wildest dreams um, to pay it forward to now helping others, you know, with that. And then all the people that you employ and are providing jobs, to, like it just goes on and on of what you can do, but it, whether that's with 10 people in your, in your company or, you know, with 500, it's that same passion has to be there throughout, in my opinion. That's beautiful, Heidi, really beautiful and inspiring for sure. But you must have had a real deep knowledge about your company that you knew in your heart that they could really be successful. Because like you said, they hit every one of those, they keep hitting it out of the park. So you must have a phenomenal team and you must surround yourself with amazing people to have the confidence that they can do it and know that it's, it's not just on you, but your team will make it happen. So that's, that's really inspiring. You've also played a bunch of different roles in your company. How has that been to continue to go? You know, I know you went from a COO to a president and now CCO. How does, how does that shift and how do people uh, adjust to your different positions? Yeah, you know, at the end of the day, I think what I fall back on is just co-founder. I mean, the other chief roles are great um, and they lend to credibility externally more than they do internally, to be honest with you. Um, just from, from where I sit today and, and what I'm responsible for within the organization and you know, that, this is where the humbleness kind of goes uh, or comes from when I mentioned that earlier because, you know, when you, when you get to the venture capital round, even, even at the smallest round of, of, you know, when we were at Canal Partners, I mean, the expectation of uh, performance and, you know, having to pay back this money that they are tr entrusting you with, right, to do something and to grow it, um, because they believe in you as a leader and they believe in you as a company and what you have to offer and you've given them, um, you know, 
your roadmap of what you're going to accomplish. And the expectation is, well, you're going to do that. Uh, and so that pressure and that responsibility um, resides on your shoulders. And um, as the company has grown, you have to be humble enough to say, I don't, I don't know what I'm doing right now, or here's what I'm really good at. And this goes back to some of the things we do in our organization even today is, you know, using the disk profile or strength finders is another good one of knowing uh, yourself and what you bring to the table and owning that to the point of this is what I'm really good at and I love doing it, right? I am not a spreadsheet financial guru. Like, did I do that as CEO in the very beginning when we were a million, $5 million company? Yep. But did I love doing it every day? Heck no. Was I, was I, was it a difficult decision to hire final, you know, get a director of finance and all of that and, and, and hand that off? Yes, it was really hard. Even though I didn't like it, it was super hard to give that to somebody else because now I feel like I wasn't in control of, of that money, but I mean, your money, right? Um, you hear the, the horror stories of people taking advantage of you and that, and that kind of realm. Um, and then you just, you lose connection with that piece sometimes, right? But if you set up the right processes in which you have constant feedback and you still have visibility into it, like there's ways that you just don't, you don't just hand it off and say, okay, well, it's your responsibility. You know what I mean? The processes that you put in place to, to stay connected with um, things that you delegate uh, is really important and, and basically how I've, I've been able to feel much more comfortable with that moving forward. Not to mention, obviously, hiring people that are very competent and are getting the job done, right? Um, and so, you know, that was kind of, um, what we did really early and we get a lot of credit for as founders is that even, um, as we went through that first round of funding, we hired a CEO, um, to come in and to round out our, uh, leadership team where I was COO, my co-founder was the CTO, and then we hired a CEO, um, and we were a very flat organization at first where we all had veto power and decision making. We we're all equal that we referred to as the trifecta, um, which was difficult, right? Because decisions, um, but we all owned different aspects of the organization where our CEO had been a previous COO. So he was very process driven. Um, and that's what we needed at that point in time. And so that helped to kind of grow the business uh, up to the 20 million where then we took in uh, the venture capital round, right? Um, and then at that next stage of the company, you know, I, I've never grown a company from 20 million to 100 million or even 50 million, right? So understanding the nuances of this is a whole new world of expectation of your venture capital firm, right? And not that they put, I mean, they obviously put a little bit of pressure on you to, to perform. And if you can't perform, well, you got to find people that are going to. Um, and so, you know, there was a certain time where, you know, the, our CEO, we had outgrown that's our CEO. So we needed to find another CEO. And, and that's how we found Nancy um, and, you know, went through a full process, culture first, all that kind of stuff. And man, has she been an amazing add to our organization to now be able to take us and, you know, go female power, um, female leadership, uh, to now take us from where we were when she joined the company um, at about 40, 45 million to where we are today at over 100. Um, with her acquisition prowess, um, you know, and then taking it, leading us through this private equity round, she had already done that, been there and done that with other organizations. And so, again, learning along the process, continuing to add my value in terms of subject matter expertise, um, you know, holding the, the company from a culture perspective, teaching her about how our culture works and, and kind of bring her into the fold of vulnerability. Like, these are all my strengths. And having other leaders around you that are willing to learn um, and you learning from them, it's that, you know, give and take, yin yang sort of thing with lots of different people. It works, but you got to have the right people in the room to, who are willing and wanting to learn as well and grow. So if you seem to really know what your unique ability is, what do you, how did you learn what it was and what, what do you think it is today? So your superpowers, everybody has one. Um, and it takes a long time. And I think it can morph over time too. Um, a little like you can sort of 
nurture a superpower that kind of might have been brewing that you didn't really know you're really good at until you get more, you know, feedback. Part of it is um, a lot of feedback. And um, also, again, sort of being will- willing to nurture what you're already good at and not necessarily worrying so much about what you're not good at. So I'm not spending a whole lot of time working on spreadsheets and trying to get better at that because I just hate it. And I just know that it's not going to be something that I'm ever going to be as good at as um, teaching, leading, writing, um, nurturing, you know, building culture, building relationships with people. That's um, something I'm really good at. Um, Finding, connecting, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, I'm able to find a role in which I can thrive and, and do that um, within the organization. Um, at the same time, not that I don't need to completely disregard that because I need to understand basic business principles and understand the business side of the company. So don't get me wrong. Like you, you can't just ignore it. But at the same time, I, I've got people that are doing that day in and day out who have the same passion and are so good at it that I could never be as good as them, Right. Um, but they respect what I bring to the table in terms of them, you know, what I can teach and, and help them with as well. I just think that this is part of what it takes. And I, I don't know, I think of women, I'm, I'm thinking about my 30 year old employees that may not yet know and need someone like me to say, look, this is your unique ability. Like I noticed this about you mm-hmm. and this is your strength and I want to play to your strength. Yep. I hope that women can spend some time either, like you said, getting feedback from others about what their unique abilities are and also doing some introspection to really see what am I really good at? And, you know, if I, if I'm a business owner, what am I really good at and hire for things that I'm not? And as a, as a leader, trying to identify what your employees and unique abilities are and then build a fantastic company based on that. So That's good stuff. Well, introspection, I think, is incredibly important. I would also say mentorship is really important because, um, you know, trying to get feedback from employees when you're a leader can be difficult because, you know, they want to please you. And there's there's a dynamic there that doesn't necessarily lend itself to the honest truth. Um, And so finding mentors that can really help guide you and, 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 you know, um, help nurture whatever that strength and superpower is, right? And ident- help you identify what that is and then continue to build on it. But then I would also say what has really helped me is to find your tribe of people. And for me, I have a tribe of women. I'm involved in YPO, which is mostly men. Um, I have, you know, these different groups of peers who are are definitely not reporting to you. There's no reason why they're they're your true friends, meaning they're willing to call you on your bullshit, right? To to yeah. not just give you blow smoke up your butt. Like they're willing to give you the honest truth. Um, and though that is truly where you find your stride, um, your confidence, and you're willing to just say, you know what, this is my superpower and I need to own it right? And, and go after it. And, and they will support you in that, right? In different ways. And so right. um, those are ways that I've helped to nurture and find the confidence to say, it's okay if I'm a co-founder and leader of a company, but maybe the financial acumen is not my strength. But I have all of these other um, great powers that are really, at the end of the day, part of the huge success of the organization. I know when we spoke, I know you have some people offshore and a lot of our listeners also, you know, are managing offshore teams. I yeah. love what we spoke about how you try to create that culture that you have in your Arizona office it's to your people that work in India. Talk to us yeah. a little bit about that. Cause I thought that was super cool. Yeah. So um, even though we outsource or we near shore as well, so we have um, part of our development team is in Bolivia and Mexico. Um, and then part of our RCM team uh, is, India, is in, the, in India. We feel like they're an extension of our team, that they are like employees and we want them to feel like they're part of our team uh, and they are part of our team. And so, um, it, you know, extending the culture to, um, them and understanding what we stand for, who we are as an organization, 
um, wanting them to embrace our values, our core values as we do, um, has been really important for us and, and, is, and has really helped to nurture relationships and, and um, the success of the productivity and everything else and, and setting expectations of what, what we want from you as a partner in the business, right? And so, um, you know, for example, our uh, VP of um, RCM, Ted, has, I mean, traveled to India on uh, pretty much almost every quarter and has now, we've also brought many more of our, our team over to India to sit side by side and do a lot of the training on our platform to make sure that they fully embrace and understand. But part of that is also introducing them to the corporate. I got on, I got on on a Skype call uh, with our India team and the leadership team to help um, to, to share with them our core values, a little bit about our mission, um, you know, what the industry kind of looks to us for in, in, in um, the U.S. so that they understand who their customer is, like who are they serving? Um, and so all of those things I feel like have been really helpful. Um, some of our near shore teams, we've actually traveled. So we have kind of this Nerf gun thing that we do and uh, within the organization. So we brought down Nerf guns. When we go to India, you know, Ted's suitcase, one of them is packed with, you know, Hershey's chocolate and, you know, things that they can't get and they, they want over there. <laughs> yeah. Chocolate's so, a great commodity in India for sure. It is. It is. And so knowing that about them and, you know, celebrating birthdays and, and babies and, you know, things that we would do with our team here, we do the same there. And um, we've just found the strength in partnership when, you know, like now um, with, you know, teams having to work from home and being able to do that quickly and uh, keep up that productivity and, and engaging with us um, uh, and understanding the, the, the importance of, of what they're doing and, and how important that is to keep the viability of clinics open here in the U S um, has, has been incredibly awesome to watch. Right. And, and them even using the same language of our mintiness and all of that in, in what we do. So it's been great. And it's so important. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay, I know our time is uh, coming to close. I want to close off with my final question to you. I deal with a lot of women business owners, and I find a trend. And as you see in YPO, the percentages of women, and in EO, I mean, where percentages of women that are doing over a million in revenue are are minimal, right? And I wonder if I have my own opinions about why, um, but I'm curious to hear why do you think it is that women are not more like you, um, you know, because I meet, there are, there are so many amazing women and you also started off from nothing like every other woman entrepreneur, you know, you remember the time when you were struggling and, you know, getting your, <laughs> right. So, you know, the grind, you, you started, you built it, you're doing it, you're, you're, you're rocking it. Um, what advice would you give to women that are keeping themselves small or not um, maybe tapping into their full potential, what would you? What advice would you give to to women like that? Well, Shady, first I'm going to say that um, there's no shame in that, and we shouldn't shame anyone who is happy with being a million dollar company, right? It's a, quite a feat to get to that million magic number because that's not easy to even get to that million dollar mark. So again, I'll go back to its personal decision making. If that makes you happy and you feel fulfilled, then more power to you. Um, but for those, if there are truly feel like, oh, I could never do that, or that there's truly something that they feel like is holding them back. I mean, I will say there are more barriers for us as women, as entrepreneurs than others, right? We know that funding is um, significantly less in percentage than, than male co-founders or male, male founders, right? Um, I actually am part of a group called Golden Seeds, which is a uh, VC firm out of New York, and they um, have put together a fund that is specifically um, supporting women-owned and women-led businesses. So I'm, I'm trying to help fight the fight on that, that end as well. Um, 
And uh, so, so there's, there's a lot, and there's a lot of sacrifice that has to, to go into um, leading a company uh, through these growth phases, right? And a lot of sacrifice in terms of the expectations that society puts on us, um, expectations that maybe your partner might have, whether that's your husband or partner. So a lot of communication, um, knowing what you really want and being willing to go for it, um, a lot of vulnerability conversations in your, your negative self-talk and being able to walk yourself out of that, your, your tribe, as I mentioned, like surrounding yourself with people that can help support you. Um, there's so many pieces of, of what, it, what it takes where sometimes I don't think men need as much of that I, whatever, for whatever reason. Um, there's not as many barriers, I guess, that you in, – in, in potential barriers that kind of you have to get through. Um, but I, I don't know. At the end of the day, it's possible. <laughs> and uh, it, it takes um, tenacity and resilience to, to push through um, and not to give up when you just feel like, man – uh, I've failed so many times, but you, what, what do you, when you look at entrepreneurs in general, right, you look at all the great ones and what is the first thing they will tell you is I had to fail 10 times before I hit that one that actually made, made it success. And all you hear about is the success, right? Until they write a book and you learn about all the other failures that they had, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, um, um, it's, uh, it, it's not easy no matter who you are. Um, but like we started this conversation with, there feels like there's a lot more things that have to, that revolve around us as women and what we feel responsible for. I know I'll just speak personally when we first started, you know, um, I never had a, someone clean my house, you know, having a nanny was like, Oh, that's kind of like, Oh, okay. Like, I don't want someone else to raise my kid. Like, you know, there's all these kind of questions of outsourcing things that you feel innately responsible for, and it's based on society, right, and maybe how you were raised. Um, but as I started to, again, this goes back to reflection on what is my priority and what is most important to me right now, um, part of what made me happy and what I wanted to be able to do with my life was grow this business. And so cleaning the house yeah, because I had the ability to potentially pay someone to do that, I had the means to do that, I could outsource that. And it, um, it allowed me more time to make more money in growing my business, right? So I could afford that, that luxury. Um, once I finally kind of, in what was my hourly, hourly cost worth, worth to me, what am I paying that person versus what should I be charging an hour for myself and my work that I'm doing? Once I kind of wrapped my head around that, it, it allowed me to say, okay, someone else can clean my house. Not that I love doing that, but you just have personal responsibility. Someone else can clean my house and I can, my worth is more than what I'm paying them. Does that make sense? Yes, for sure. Because I feel exactly the same way. Like, I don't even yeah. know what my laundry room looks like. <laughs> I haven't done a load of laundry in like years. Um, yeah. But yeah, I, I, but because I don't think that that's my unique ability. I don't feel that's what I, what I was meant to do. I, I never liked to clean, even from when I was a little kid. So yeah. Um, yeah. to me, it's way more exciting to build a business. Yeah. And um, I noticed, you now I have two daughters, and um, I realized, you know, my mother's a stay at home mom. And I realized that my daughters are really do look up to me. And they are very intrigued about what I do, even though they don't fully understand it. Mm -hmm. But as they continue to get older, um, it's a good role model to play as a mom. Um, mm -hmm. Cause you know, I think that we have a tremendous contribution that we can give yeah. to society and um, why not be the best versions of ourselves? You know? Well, when you look at all of the research and data right now, right. That's coming out about why women should be on boards and why, you know, why people should invest in women leaders. I mean, we are so much more successful <laughs> and, and boards with diversity and more women on them are, are, you know, I don't know what the, the specific statistics are, but they're definitely much better off in terms of making decisions as an organization and being profitable as an, as a company 
than, than those that are not. And so, um, you know, there is definitely, there's definitely a place for more of us and we need more people. We need more women to have the aspirations of, of going down this path, uh, for sure. And, and I hope people like you can continue to inspire, inspire more women to, to, to find their superpower and, and push towards that strength and, and, break through that ceiling, if you will, I guess, uh, because there, it, there is light on the other side. You, you, there is sacrifice, so you can't necessarily have it all, but you need to figure out what's most important to you and then, and then be okay with that. Love it. Heidi, I love you. You're just awesome. <laughs> okay. So where can people find you? Um, so I'm on LinkedIn. So uh, Heidi Janenga on LinkedIn. Um, is probably the best way to find me. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to respond if anybody has further questions after listening to this. Um, whatpt.com is our website. Um, we have a, a huge About Us page and then an amazing, amazing blog in which we talk a lot about culture in there, um, uh, as well as you can find our core values on that page as well. Thank you so much, Heidi. Thanks for spending the time with me today. Thank you so much for listening. For more information on how to grow your business, visit our website at 4dglobalinc.com. That's the number four, the letter D is in David, global, G-L-O-B-A-L-I-N-C.com. Click on the Owner's Academy tab for more videos on sales, marketing, operations, and leadership. If you are in the healthcare space and would like to learn more about how to get started with an employee in India or how to start a risk-free free trial with 4D Global, click on the Get Started for Free button on our website to book a time with someone on our team. See you next time.